years and years ago, as when I was um, in practice as a lawyer, I would um, occasionally manage to get away on holiday. And there came a moment during a holiday when I would dread the thought, when I get back to my desk, will I even be able to read and understand a letter? That kind of thing happened as one was floating in the sun off the sea off a Greek island or something. So similar thoughts have been going through my mind now, but I shall have to discipline, discipline myself out of what's known as the defilements, which is a very appropriate word because it's the very first word that we are dealing with in verse four, which you, are you, is it, am I still on shared screen, everyone? Yeah, yes. can you? Okay. So I will just recite, as I, we were discussing earlier before you all joined, I, I wish I was better at chanting. Um, I'm not terribly good at chanting. Rely on me for the grammar and the technical bits and the pronunciation. So I shall just recite this verse in a, a fairly normal way. And then we shall, we shall analyze it. And by the way, if any one of you thinks that the klesha, or in Pali Kilesa, if anyone thinks of that as the defilements, I, I've got some news for you, which is hopefully quite, quite good news. You ought to be, by the end of this, or indeed near the beginning of this, you should be looking at the word in a new way. So here we go. Um, this is verse four of chapter seven of the Bodhicharyavatara. I'll, uh, I'll read it slowly twice. Klesha Vagurika Grata Pravishto Janma Vaguram Kimadyapina Janasi Mrityor Vadanamagata. And again, Klesha Vagurika Grata Pravishto Janma Vaguram Kimadyapina Janasi Mrityor Vadanamagata. If Shantideva had been saying those words to his listening to his listeners. He wouldn't have been chanting. He would have been screaming at them in exasperation, because this verse and the, the second line of it is like, "Wake up, you fools!" No kind of lovely Sanskrit chanting. It's "Wake up, fools!" Kimadyap in the Janasik. Haven't you got it yet, you idiots? There's, there's nothing, and he's being kind to them, but there's nothing gentle about the language here. But let's start off with um, Klesha, Klesha Vagurika Grata Pravishto Janma Vaguram. Um, actually, let's start off with Vishn Pravishto. That just means entered. Um, I'll go on to my iPad screen now. It, oops, sorry. There's the common root, vish. Um, for those who um, aren't familiar, though I think you should be now, when, when I write this square root sign, that means it, it's the root of the verb, the, the, the irreducible form, the vish. Vish means to enter, almost always written with a pra, or used with a pra in front of it meaning forth or, or in um, pr pravish, just means to enter. And the past participle is pravishta. But when you have a, a final sh plus ta, it always become, they become retroflex. So pravishta, it means entered. We'd say you have entered in Sanskrit. We tend to say you are entered a bit more like um, Italian and French. So pravishta, entered. So meaning you have entered, you are entered. Entered into what? The janma vaguram. Vagura is a trap. Which means the root jan, it's you know, cognate with you know, the, the Latin gen and, and the Greek gen, generation, genesis. It's, the, it's etymologically the same word, to be born. And janma, just like many words, 
make a noun out of a verbal root by ending a m, as we do in, in Greek. Like theor, theoro, I see theorema, which we have in modern English, theos, the, theorem, um, making a, a verb, uh, sorry, a noun out of a verb. So janma is birth. And from the same root, by the way, we get the word jati, meaning birth. It, jati is a, a much more commonly used, uh, used word, meaning birth. It's from the same root. Now, vagura means a trap. Being meticulously mathematical and scholarly about languages as I am, we always like to try to find a root. You get back to the irreducible root and janma, jati, and so on, jato, and yet the root jan, and pravishta, praveshana, back to the root vish. There are quite a few words where this won't work. Vagura is one. And also, once you get used to the Indo-European languages, you'll see that Vagura doesn't have an Indo-European look about it. This is highly likely to be one of those words. This is Vagura here, meaning trap. Trap as in um, trapping animals, hunters trapping animals. It's highly likely to be a Dravidian word. A lot of Dravidian words have come into Sanskrit. Um, mo a large proportion of them um, are um, plants and animals that didn't exist in the early, where the Indo-European speakers lived in earliest times. But when they migrated down, down to India, they adopted the uh, Dravidian words for them. And the modern Dravidian languages, of course, you know, things like Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, Kannara, and so on. So Vagura looks like a Dravidian word. Anyway, it means trap. And it's come in and I was adopted by Sanskrit. So Janma, the Janma Vagura, Janma Vagura is the birth trap, the trap of birth or the trap of rebirth. So described here as he's talking here to people who are already alive in their human body. And they're trapped now into rebirth. Why are they trapped? Because of the kleshas. So, pravishto, entered, meaning you are entered. Janma vaguram. Vaguram, now add an N, M on the end to make it accusative. It's a feminine accusative. Pravishto, janma vaguram. We'll get this in the, in the grammar lessons properly, but where you have a verb of motion, um, the motion towards the same as Latin, it, it, it takes the accusative, same as Latin and German and Greek. It takes, so, pravishto janma vaguram entered, meaning you are entered into the birth trap. And in what condition or status are you? What is it that causes you to be walking into this trap? You know, walking into this janma vagura, this birth trap, is because your klesha vagurika grata. Now, the klesha va vagurika grata sounds like a bit of a mouthful of a compound. Um, the reason it sounds like that is because, unless we break it down, it is klesha vagurika grata, is a bit of a mouthful, but let's break it down. So we have, sorry, I'm, oh yeah, we're, we are sharing the right thing. So klesha, now we have vagura is a trap. And uh, so a vagurika is a trapper, as in a hunter, you know, trapper traps wild animals. Vagura trap, vagurika trapper. And agrata. Gra is the ordinary word meaning to, to smell, in other words, catch the scent of something. 
if you put the prefix agra this r uh, is probably cognate with the latin ad meaning to or towards the these trappers are kind of scenting you out they're smelling you they're following the scent reaching you by following the scent so they're smelling you out agra you are smelt out agrata so gra is the root past participle grata scented or smelt agrata smelt out smelt out by what you vagurika agrata trapper smelt in other words smelt out by the trappers sniffed out they're following your trail vagurika agrata now the klesha vag vagurika is the the klesha trappers in other words the the kleshas are being compared uh to trappers who are hunting you down to catch you in the trap of rebirth the word klesha many of you will know it in pali as kilesa the same word just in pali pronunciation the kleshas are commonly translated as the defilements I think we've all been told in our Buddhist studies that these are the defilements. Defilements is a bit of a misleading translation. It's not totally wrong. This is one of these instances that we get so often um in complex concepts and complex words where a translation, a single word translation is misleading in suggesting that the single word is all there is to it well there's not and in the case of defilements hopefully i'll give you a new angle on it the root is klish why does klish become klesha well you'll see this more and more as we go along there are, there are hundreds of roots that um have an e followed by a single vowel that make the a single consonant rather vid becomes veda vish becomes vesha and bud becomes bud bodhi and so on this is something you you learn it it's from it's from from that same root so the noun form from klish is klesha now klish itself has got nothing to do with defilement when we think of defilement in english it's only, it's like a moral judgment defile you dirty boy now in old in sanskrit it originally did not have that meaning klish meant to 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 afflict or to torment so when somebody was suffering from the what we call the three defilements it was originally it came to be something of a moral judgment but originally it was something that afflicts you or torments you something horrible that you didn't want to have like 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 an injury or a hurt or an illness that was the original meaning of it so when we have translated as defilement it imports as it were an exclusively moral judgment that i don't think was there in in earliest times it was something that afflicts you maybe not even through your own fault yes your own fault for not taking action when you see you've got it but not your own fault for having it to start with you might be unfortunate in contracting an illness but it would be your fault if you didn't attend to it and manage it and cure it the clashes linguistically um are a bit the same and in in the early sanskrit texts even in the even in 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 the classics um clish if you um for example let's make a past participle out of this if you clishta and manas meaning mind if somebody was clishta manas they'd they'd be grieving in deep sorrow with afflicted minds somebody who has suffered a grave misfortune would be klishta manas 
So nothing to do with being defiled there is suffering a grave misfortune. So klesha then, originally an affliction, something awful that happened to you, and then by extension came to mean, could expand then into a moral defect if you, as it were, consciously gave way to it or just lazily gave way to it. So these, these klesha vagurika, vagura trap, vagurika trapper, the klesha vagurika, the klesha trappers, these trappers, the kleshas who are out to trap you, like out to snare an, an animal. So you're klesha vagurika grata, you're klesha trapper um, centered. You've got these kleshas who are like trappers who've sniffed you out. They've found you. So you have your pravishto, you are entered janma vaguram into the birth vagura, the, the trap of birth. Why? Because you're klesha vagurika grata. You are centered out like the hounds have followed your scent and sniffed you out. And then the next line. Here it's as if Shantideva is just screaming at them. Let me go back to the, let me go back. To, can I get to the, yeah. Let me highlight it here. Why can't I highlight it? Here we are. Oops. He's screaming at them in exaggeration. You might hear this being recited. No, he would be saying, Haven't you got it yet? Wake up. Adia. Adia. Means today or now. It's actually in Latin we have hudie. Is there any Singhala speakers with us? It's um, ada in Singhala. In, in modern Hindi, it's aj. So it means today or now. The and api, adia api. Api means even. Even now, even after all this time, have you still not got it? And the adhyapi by the ordinary rules of Sandhi becomes adhyapi. Just an aside here. You will often see it written by scholars. Many Williams does it as well. You'll see it written with a, a circumflex. That's simply to indicate to the student that it's a merger of the final R plus an, an initial R merging into R. So written like that, just to remind you, it's two vowels merged into one. This circumflex is, is used only in, oh, sorry, thank you, Odin. <laughs> remind me to use the notepad. So I was writing adia hodie at the arj and then adia api. Sorry about that. Um, adia api, I'm underlining there, often written with a circumflex, just to remind you it's two vowels. In the Devanagari script, this convention is not used, it's just written as a long R. Ah, we'll be coming to that shortly. So adia api, today even, even now. The kim, the first word in this. Kim means two things. It means um, what? Kim Karoti, what's he doing? Kim Vadasi, what are you saying? But as well as it's meaning what, it also is just a particle that introduces a question. It's a word that indicates that what follows is a question. So if you just said, Adhyapina Janasi, you still don't know. Even today, you don't know. That's a statement. Kimadhyapi na Janasi. That just turns it into a question. Incidentally, it's um, exactly the same in Pali. Kim both means what and is a question marker. 
incidentally, those who know Hindi, it's the same in modern Hindi, the word kya. Um, let's write it down here. Kya in modern Hindi means both what and is a question particle. So, kimadyapin na janasi. Even today, do you not know? Have, have you still not got it? The Janasi, you know, is from the well known root, Nya, written as a J Nya, but uh, modern Brahmins pronounce it as a, like a Nya, Nya. Sorry, long R. And as we know, it's you know, cognate with gno as in gnosis. Um, we have cognoscere um, in, in Latin, and indeed um, cognate with our English word no, which used to be pronounced gno, cognate with gna. For the Russian speakers among you, it's. Um, to, to know is znach, that nya, zna, and the kna, Greek gna, it's all from that, that same root. Sorry, in, in um, Roman script is that. So nya, to know, it's, um, no, I'm going to restrain myself from going into the grammar of why nya becomes janasi, it's just to mention it's a, a ninth conjugation verb. There's a lot of delight coming for those who love large numbers of different co co conjugations. But honestly, it's quite simple once you get down to it. There are lovely, lovely patterns running through, through Sanskrit. Just, just learn for the moment that um, it's slightly irregular. So janasi, you know, no, janami. I know, janati. He, he knows. Those of you who um, stick with me long enough when we go into our um, Thomas Eg Eginus, we'll, we'll, we'll get, get, get to that. It looks very daunting to start with, but hopefully I will be able to guide you through it and you'll see what a garden of delights the complications of the Sanskrit verb really is. So, Kimadyapi Najanasi. Do you still not know? By the way, the C ending is um, characteristic of you, singular. You are bhavasi. And the Buddha said to Mara, you have been seen, ditto si, you are seen. Mrityor um, vadanam agata. Let's look at vadanam. As with most words, we can, most Sanskrit words, we can trace this to a simple root. Vad. If any of you think you don't know it, you already do in a different form. There's so much that you already know without knowing that you know it until you're told why you know it. Many roots that have a short a ah followed by a single consonant in the root as an ad, short a, ah, then single consonant. Incidentally, when we write this, a short a ah is just written like that normally in transliteration. When I write the micron underneath, underneath it just over, it just, just to contrast, to emphasize that it's you know, short rather than long. So vad, the root vad, Many of these roots will lengthen the a ah and add a short a ah at the end to make a verbal noun. So vad vada means saying. Vad to say vada saying, and by extension teaching that which a certain body or group of people say is their vada. So here we have the the teravada. It's from that root vad. The terra is the elders. Vada saying, the sayings of the elders, what the elders say, therefore, the teaching of the elders, Theravada. Now, by a curious kind of linguistic 
mission creep, as it were. One way of forming um, a noun from a root is to add ana. So vadana. Sometimes it was with an a as in passana, vipassana, but it can be with a short a as well, vadana. By extension means that part of you through which you say things and therefore your mouth. The organ of saying is the vadana, the thing that does the saying. The saying comes out of your mouth. And here it's used in that sense that you have entered. Do you not know? Do you not yet know? Haven't you got it yet that you are walking right into the jaws of death? So, mrityor vadanam agata. Agata meaning you've come. Mrityu. Sorry, mrityu. It's from the root. Mri. Which we have, of course, in um, it's the, the, the Latin mors, death, our English word mortal. Mri and um, mori, to die. Latin. Um, so, mri, incidentally, the word moor, um, as in Dartmoor, you know, the, the Yorkshire moors, it's from that same root. It's the dead lands. It's the land where you, you can graze sheep on them, but you can't cultivate them. They're high and wild. It's called the moors, the dead lands, from that same root, mri, meaning dead. So, from mri, we have the noun. <coughs> Sorry. Um, which is cognate with you know the Latin in the accusative you know, mortem, you know, a, a post mortem after death. So mortu mortem. It's that same it's that same word. It makes its genitive. It's a masculine, and the masculines ending in a short u make their genitive in. Oh, that's right, mrityo, so of death, mrityo. And by sandhi, mrityo plus a vowel or a voiced consonant, as in v, becomes or, mrityo vadanam. Sandhi, I hope you all know what san Sandhi is. It's the combination of sounds between the end of one word and the beginning of the next. Those of you who will be staying with me, I hope all of you will be staying with me for the Sanskrit grammar. Um, there's a fair bit to be learnt. It's, ju it's just the way the wo words combine when they join. So on its own, of death is mrityur. When it's joined to another word, mrityur vadanam. Becomes a r, brichur vedanam. Ah, here's another one that you know without knowing that you know. The word for life is ayu. When it's joined with a following word that starts with a, a voiced consonant. It becomes a r as in brichur vadanam. And you all now know how to make the sandhi for that. You already know it. It's ayurveda. It's because by sandhi, the u uh becomes ur before the v. Ayurveda. You see, <laughs> you didn't think you knew that sandhi, but you all did. There's so much that you know without realizing that you, that you, that you knew it. So mrityur vadanam. Um, the jaws of death. In Sanskrit, um, the word in the genitive tends to precede the thing, um, precede the, 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 um, the thing owned, as it were. Rather like our apostrophe F, you can say, 
death's jaws. We can do it in either of two ways in English. We put one first with the apostrophe as you can't say jaws, deaths. It has to be deaths, jaws, as a matter of English grammar. This is how it's all almost invariably done in, in Sanskrit. You put the word in the, the possessive form followed by the thing own. So that's why it's mrityor vadanam. If you said vadanam mrityor, yeah, occasionally you could, but you know, in poetry, if you needed to shift the shift the order of the words, but 99% of the time, mrityor vadanam. So mrityor vadanam agata. Agata, come, as the as in the past um, participial sense. Venuto, vous êtes venu. You are come as the past participle. So from our root gum, which you will know to go, it makes it slightly regular in the present tense. It becomes gachati. You will know that anyway. Because you have all chanted Buddhang Saranam Gachami. And there we are. That's the gum that becomes in the present tense Gachami, I go. Saranam, or in Pali, Saranam Gachami, I go for refuge. Buddhang Saranam Gachami, the Buddha refuge, I go. And when I told you about the verbs of motion, the thing that you go to is put in the accusative. You see, it's just dawned on me. That's another thing you already know, because you already know that in the nominative, in the stem form, it's Buddha. In the nominative, probably most of you know, it's Buddha. But when you're going to the Buddha, we already know that that's in the accusative. Because you get buddham gachami. I've left a space deliberately. Buddham gachami. I go to the Buddha. So that's why I haven't written that well. That's why the buddham is in the accusative here. Go to the Buddha. Buddham gachami. And it, this has a double accusative. The Buddha refuge I go, I go to the Buddha as refuge. They're both in the both in the accusative, both governed by um, Gachami. So Buddhang Saranang Gachami, incidentally, identical in Sanskrit and Pali, this particular phrase, say that in Sanskrit, it's a sh, not a sa. Pali Buddhang Saranang Gachami, Sanskrit Buddhang Saranang Gachami. So Agata, gum, the root. It makes its past, past participle with gata. And if any of you wants to say, oh, I didn't know that gum makes its past participle with gata, well, you're all wrong because you all do know it, because you all know the expression tata gata. It's that same gata. It's the past participle from gum, tatagata. Often translated as, uh, very literally, as thus gone. There's quite a bit more to it than that, um, which we don't really have time to, 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 to deal with now. Um, that we might at the end, we're, we're, we're near, near, nearly there. Hang on, why am I talking about not having time? We don't have to finish the end of this verse in the hour allotted. We can spend it, it simply does, doesn't matter. If you all allow me, and I think you're all muted, so you can't really stop me, I shall just um, carry on as I, as I hope will be, will be useful. Okay, I can, those of you whose faces I can. I can see look reasonably pleased about it, especially Mariano. Mariano is looking very pleased with it. Thank you, Mariano. Very good. <laughs> um, 
Where were we? Yes, okay. So, Mrityur Vadanam Agata, here we are. So, Agata, we've got Gata now, you know, means gone. As in Tathagata. And at the end of the Heart Sutra, you have um, Gate, Gate, Parangate, Parasangate. It's that same Gata used here in the, um, the feminine vocative. Don't bother about that yet. So, with the gum basically means to go. If you add the prefix ah to it, it reverses the meaning. So it just means come. If, if so, if you are agata, it means that you have come or you are come. So mrityor vadanam agata, agata come vadanam to the jaws at the accusative motion vadanam mrityor of death. Now, note all of you, on this, on the sheet, hang on, I'll get back, on the sheet, you see mrityor, I've highlighted in grey there, but I just said of death is mrityor. You've seen it in, ending in or, and you've seen it ending in o. It's because when you're pronouncing the word in isolation, no word is allowed to end in isolation in a ra or a sa in Sanskrit. It changes to this visarga, the subdusted H. So you heard me saying mrityo of death because it appears in isolation in a pause. In running speech and running script, the it becomes mrityor vadanam, mrityor vadanam, because it's uh, followed by a v. The, by the way, the subdotted H, I'm bouncing all over the place. Um, and you might say, oh, we haven't got to this bit yet. Well, the answer is yes, we have, because we're here right now. The subdotted H is called the Visarga, which means the releasing, the expulsion, letting go, emitting something, because it's a release of breath. Ritual, Buddha. There are various different pronunciations of it um, by different, even in modern Brahmins will pronounce it slightly differently. It doesn't particularly matter how you can pronounce it. Mrityo, Buddha, with a uh, sound. Sometimes it's pronounced as Buddha, Mrityo, with a, uh, repeating the vowel after it. We won't um, detain ourselves on that now. So we've got Mrityo Vadanam Agata. Come to the jaws of death. Kimadhyapi Najanasi. Do you not yet know? Meaning, haven't you seen it yet? Haven't you got it yet? Kimadhyapi Najanasi. There's nothing terribly poetical or high flown about Kimadhyapi Najanasi. You can just hear somebody screaming it at somebody else in Sanskrit, highly colloquial. Haven't you got it yet, you numbskull? Kimadyap in the Janasi? Mrityor Vadanam Agata. Agata, you are come, Mrityor Vadanam. So, what I'll do, I don't know if any questions have come in yet. What I'll do is just I'll read it through slowly once. And if there are any questions in, I'll take them. So, Glesha, I shall bring up the text. Here we are. Glesha Vagurika Grata Pravishto Janma Vaguram Kimadhyapina Janasi Mrityor Vadanam Agata. Right, have, um, have any questions come in, administrators? Not yet. Ah, hopefully that means that either there's total blank in comprehension or the comprehension is so complete that there are no, no questions left. <laughs> ah, a raised hand I see from Mariano. Please, Mariano. Uh, un un unmute. 
You're muted, Mariano. Okay. Can you hear me? We can now, thank you. Oh, lovely. Klesha Vagurika Grata. Slightly different. Uh, if it is a compound, a complex compound, could mm. it not be uh, that you are smelled out, you are sniffed out uh, due to the klesha? As a what? slight uh, twisting off. Could it be an interpretation? Um, you are sniffed out because of the clashes. Yeah. If it were Klesha Agrata or with Santi Klesha Agrata, yes, I would say yes. Um, that would be a very good one. But with the Vagurika, you've got to link the um, Vagurika. You hang on, yeah, actually, yes, that's a good point you've made, Mario. There, there, there is a possibility, as with um, with these compounds in Sanskrit. There's there's very often more than one way of breaking them down and one way of in, interpreting them. Um, if you are Vagurika. Vagurika grata, you are trapper smell, you are sniffed out, scented out by the trappers. Klesha Vagurika grata, you are scented out by the trappers because of your kleshas. Is that what you meant? Yeah. I would say theoretically, at a stretch, just about. I think it would it would strain the language. If you missed out the Vagurika, then you'd be right. Klesha Grata was smelt out either by the Kleshas or because of the Kleshas. Um, okay. And uh, another one, but it is a very long shot. Agatha, it is uh, a name of a person, isn't it? Santa Agatha. Is it uh, from the same uh, root? Or is it something different? So what was the name? Shantagata? Uh, uh, Santagata in Italia. Agata is uh, a name of a person, yeah? Ah. Um, it's a very long shot. I guess, uh, um, as in our favorite crime writer, Agatha. Um, no. I'm virtually no, no, even by your standards, Mariano. That 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 that, <laughs> that shot is very, very long, long indeed. Um, <laughs> no, no, sorry, sorry, I can't, can't, can't allow that. <laughs> Agatha is very firmly from the root gum. Yep. Gata. Uh, and uh, the, the, there is uh, something that I I suppose. Um, uh, it is due to the length of the vowel, but Zhang as in Jane generation and, and so on. And Janas, Janasi is different though. So is the difference the length of the first A or? Um... Sorry, the um, di 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 difference in, in what? Janasi. Mm. It couldn't be from uh, the uh, root Jung, could it? I mean, as in gen, generation or whatever. Uh, it no, from... it's, um, it's not. What, what happens is, um, okay, I said I wasn't going to go, go down that rabbit hole. You kind of forced force me a little bit there. Um, there is a certain category of verbs um, where you add in a na as part of the conjugation. So the verb kri, meaning to buy, it's a ninth class. Um, and in the conjugation, you add in a na before the endings. It comes in right here. So kri nati. It's not kriti, he buys, but krinati. 
It's just in the ninth class, they all had this characteristic na. Okay. As so, well. and, and, and uh, hang on, because this is, we've got a complication here. Sorry to stop you, but I hadn't finished my co complication. Janasi is such a verb, but you would expect it because the root is nya and it's ninth class. You'd expect it, you know, you'd expect it to be nyanasi, but irregularly this nya drops out. So it becomes janasi. It is to that extent slightly irregular. So what happens to jang as in generate? You okay. generate? That again, you really want to go into irregular verbs today, don't you, Mariana? Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jan as in generate. Okay, that is simple enough. Um, it is slightly irregular. Slightly irregular. Um, it's the fourth class verb, which means that instead of adding ati, it adds this ya is inserted. For example, bud to know to be aware doesn't make make buddhati but buddhiati. Hmm? Jan is a fourth class verb, so you'd expect it to be then okay janyati. But irregularly, it drop it lengthens the a ah and drops the a. Sorry, it length lengthens the a ah and drops the n. And it's a parasma, it says jayate. Okay. Um, musical chairs. Okay. Musical chair. That's a nice way of look, looking at it. I've never seen any <laughs> Sanskrit grammarian describing it as mu 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 musical chairs. But, uh, <laughs> Thank you. We will see if we can find a verdi aria that we can you know, put these um, Sanskrit co co conjugations in. <laughs> right, so we're almost at the top of the hour, as they say. So unless we, um, unless there are any, any questions. Ah, Desmond, a hand raised. Yes, um, can you hear me? I, we can, yes. We can. Yes, they, they use kanka a lot in the old texts as translation for Kalesha. Oh, yes. The kankas. The kankas. Actually, I would say that that's actually better than defilement because a kanka is something that, like, was the old word for cancer, of course, um, and it's a, something that severely afflicts you. Very much so, yeah. And, uh, it uh, does indeed. And there's no, initially, there's no moral overtone to it. You know, if you've got cancer, poor chap, you know, it may not be your fault. Um, so that actually is probably cl closer to it. Well, there is a sort of a movement towards taking a, a sort of non-moral line, isn't there, with people with, with mental disorders of one kind or another. Indeed. Over the last ten years, has been a tremendous move towards not looking at it, looking at people who have mental disorders if they've got something morally wrong with them. Because the mm -hmm. kind of feeling yeah. really was, I think, under Christianity that it was, you know, they were morally weak in some way or another. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're certainly ignorant, but you know, the, uh, it only comes with knowledge, doesn't it? When it becomes a moral weakness, with you know, with with um, with the dawning of sort of the light, so to speak. Before that, you're blameless, but once you know, it suddenly turns into something else. It turns its valency from neutrality into something else. Well, the, yeah, I mean, I think you've put your finger right on the spot there, Desmond, because it's uh, the, the original meaning of klish in Sanskrit. There's, there's no moral o overtone to it. It's like a kank, it's something that has uh, afflicted you. And then it turns into a moral thing at exactly that moment when you see what the problem is, but out of your laziness or apathy, refuse to do anything about it. So it's the, the moral choice what to do about it once you've seen the problem. That is where it becomes a moral thing. But mm. having, having the problem to start with before you have seen it, of course, is, you know, as it were, pure bad luck or the human con con condition. Mm, mm. Mm. There is another thing. There is a there is a canker, um, which is a kind of venereal disease, you know, and it's called a, a canker. 
Oh. So that's a result of, you know, sexual intercourse with someone who's diseased. It's kind mm -hmm. of, you know, it's a result of a union with something which has given you this thing, you know, this canker. Um, so I think there's something, it's, it's quite interesting, really, because it's, because you've actually in unwittingly engaged with something which has given you an affliction. That's right. You know? I mean, and you may have been, it might be entirely your fault if, say, a man has picked it up, but it may, he might you know, pass it on to his entirely you know, innocent wife. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very inter interesting. Uh, and also, it's a bit like, you know, COVID-19 hunting you down, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting yes. at an airport and this thing is, <laughs> COVID is waiting for you. Mm. <laughs>